Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, we're looking tonight at verses 18 through 21. We've been going through Ephesians. When we get done with VBS, we'll launch back into the book of Genesis. But for tonight, we're in Ephesians chapter 5 as we're winding down this prison epistle of Paul. And remember, this letter was a circular letter. It wasn't written just to one church. It was probably written to a multitude of churches that were in Asia Minor. And remember what I told you, the theme of this letter is the church, the body of Christ. The church is not a building, a brick and mortar. The church is made up of believers who have embraced Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, as we come to chapters four through six, what he's talking about here is the walk of the church. He calls it the worthy walk in chapter four, verse one. He says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have received. And then what he does in chapters 4 through 6 is he tells us what that worthy walk looks like. How do you know you're walking worthy before God? How do you know you're pleasing God? Well, let me review what we've looked at thus far. First of all, if you and I are going to walk worthy, we must walk in unity. And so would you say the general tenor of your life is to walk in unity? Or are you a person who's constantly embroiled in conflict? Are you divisive as a person? You can't walk worthy if you're a divisive personality. Secondly, we're to walk in service. How do you know if you're walking worthy before the Lord? Are you using your gifts to serve other people? And if you don't know your gifts, are you willing to jump in and get involved and do something? Thirdly, he says we're to walk in separation at the end of chapter four. In other words, are you walking different than the world? You're not going to be perfect, but Is there a distinctiveness in your life that demonstrates that you're truly a Christian? Because if you say you're a Christian and people on your work find out that you're a Christian and they laugh, (laughs) so-and-so's a Christian? Really? See, that's a problem. Not that you're going to be perfect, but a person who's walking worthy is going to walk in separation, not isolation. And then we looked at chapter 5, the fourth component of a worthy walk is we must walk in love. He talks about that in verses 1 and 2, and then he says, number 5, we're to walk in the light, and then last week we looked at the next component of our worthy walk, and that is we're to walk in wisdom. We talked about that. Now for this evening, we want to look at the second, seventh component of a worthy walk, and that is we are to walk in the Spirit. We're to walk in the Spirit. In fact, I would say that this component right here makes all the other ones work. Because if you don't walk in the Spirit and I don't walk in the Spirit as a Christian, I'm not going to be able to walk in unity, walk in service, walk in separation, walk in love, walk in the light, walk in wisdom. I cannot do that if I don't walk in the Spirit. Now, the key here is verse 18. He says this, be filled with the Spirit. Basically, to be filled with the Spirit means to walk in the Spirit. Because if you're filled with the Spirit, and I'm going to define that in a little bit, you're going to actually walk in the Spirit. Notice Galatians 5, because it uses this language of walking in the Spirit. In verse 16, Paul says, so I say, walk by the Spirit. And the word walk there is our general lifestyle, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then in verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And so here's the point. If you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to naturally walk as a lifestyle in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you have to make a distinction between being filled with the Spirit and being indwelt by the Spirit. Every Christian is indwelt by the Spirit by default. The moment you said yes to Jesus and you were genuinely converted, the Holy Spirit came to live in you. In fact, If I could use this acrostic, ribs, this is exactly what happened to you at the moment of salvation. You'll remember it because my favorite food is ribs. I love ribs. But here's what happened to you at salvation. You were regenerated by the Spirit. That means you were dead and then God made you alive. You were born again. And then I, you were indwelt. You were baptized into Christ. That's not water baptism. That's spirit baptism. God made you one with Jesus Christ. And then you were sealed with the Spirit. All of these happened at the same time, simultaneously, the moment you became a Christian. Now, the one I want to focus on 
is you were indwelt by the Spirit at the moment of salvation. Now, here's the question. Is it possible to be indwelt by the Spirit and filled with the Spirit at the moment of salvation? Absolutely. But here's the deal. You are only indwelt by the Spirit one time. At the moment of salvation, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to live in you. That is a one-time transaction where the Spirit takes up residence in your soul. On the other hand, as we're going to see, the filling of the Spirit is something that happens continually throughout your Christian life. And so here's the deal. You're either controlled by the Spirit or filled with the Spirit, or you're controlled more by your flesh. And you know what? It's a constant battle. Because you and I can be controlled by the Spirit, or we can be controlled by the flesh. In fact, if you look at that picture up on the screen, you'll notice a tug of war. I think we all experience this in our life. We got the flesh going on, we got the Spirit going on. You say, well, how do I know if I'm a Spirit-filled Christian? We're going to look at the evidences here soon. But here's the deal. A spirit-filled Christian has Jesus on the throne of his life. If you look at this diagram, you'll notice that prior to salvation, self was on the throne on the left side, and Jesus was outside of your life. But when you became a Christian, Jesus is to be on the throne of your life, and self is to be on the outside. And so, the right side is a person who is spirit-filled. Jesus rules in their life. They're not perfect, but Jesus is the center and circumference of their life. Jesus is the Lord of their life. A Spirit-filled Christian doesn't just take Jesus as their Savior. They take Jesus as their Lord. They're not just interested in fire insurance. They're interested in serving Jesus. As I've said before, a Spirit-filled Christian is not a timeshare Christian. You know what a timeshare Christian is? You've been to a timeshare before. I've said this before, but it's worth repeating because you probably have forgotten. When you go to a timeshare, you listen to the spiel, and your intent is after two hours, what do you want? You want the free tickets to Disney World. You're not interested in buying the timeshare. And so a timeshare Christian is someone who wants the benefits of Christianity, but they don't want to commit to the timeshare. They don't want to buy. They don't want to follow Jesus. You see, that person listen carefully, is a carnal Christian. A carnal Christian is someone who's been saved, who has genuinely been forgiven of their sins, but their flesh controls them more than the Spirit of God. That's a carnal Christian. And you see, the American church today, I believe, is filled with carnal Christians. Now, some of these people think they're saved and they're really not saved. There's a lot of self-deception in the American church But I believe the landscape of Christianity is littered with carnal Christians whereby the flesh controls their lifestyle more than the Spirit of God. Now, as we look at this passage of Scripture, Paul is going to tell us three things about walking in the Spirit or being a Spirit-filled Christian. First of all, I would have you note the command to be filled with the Spirit, the command to be filled with the Spirit. Notice, if you will, verses 17 and 18. He says this, So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, someone's going to say, well, what is the will of God for my life? Well, here's the will of God, verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. And here's the command that he gives in verse 18. But be filled with the Spirit. You see, in the Greek, that is a command. It is not a suggestion. It is not optional for the Christian. Rather, it is a command. You and I are commanded by God to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And here's what's interesting. Normally, I don't get technical with this, but in the Greek, it's used in the passive voice, which means something on the outside comes in and controls us. Now, it's not necessarily a mystical thing but it means that somebody on the outside, that would be the Holy Spirit, actually takes up residency in our life and controls us. And here is what the Greek says, be being kept filled with the Spirit. It means it's a continual thing. It's present. It's ongoing. You and I are to be kept filled with the Spirit as a lifestyle. That means there are times, if not daily, you and I get in the flesh 
And then we have to assume and allow the spirit to control us. We all know when we get in the flesh, right? We have an argument with our spouse and we say something we shouldn't say. Our kids test our patience. And we get impatient and we snap at them. We get in the flesh. And we have to say, Lord, forgive me for that. Or you're driving and you see a billboard and you start lusting in your mind. You get in the flesh. Or you know you shouldn't do something. You're struggling on the internet and you do it anyway. There's a multitude of ways that we all battle the flesh. You see, there's this constant struggle that we have to keep this command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You say, well, Mike, how can I obey this command? How can I be a spirit-filled Christian? How can I let the spirit control me more than I let my carnal nature control me? And listen, it's a constant battle, and you're going to have times where you fail on a regular basis. But being a spirit-filled Christian means you allow the spirit to control you as a lifestyle. You say, well, how can I do that? How can I obey this command? Let me give you four suggestions. If you want to obey the command to be filled with the Spirit, number one, the Bible says you need to surrender. You need to surrender your life to God. That is an initial decision, and that is a moment-by-moment decision to let the Spirit of God control you. And by the way, the word filled doesn't mean filling up a cup. The word filled means control. It means you allow the Spirit to control you not filling up a cup. You see, you and I don't leak the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Spirit in the sense that we let the Spirit control us, but you got to surrender. Not only at salvation, but a moment by moment, you got to yield your will to the Holy Spirit. It's like you're saying, all right, Lord, I'm yielding moment by moment in obedience to you. Secondly, if you want to be filled with the Spirit, you got to study the Word of God. You got to study the Word of God because Colossians chapter 3 says, Let the word of Christ dwell within you richly. You cannot be a spirit-filled Christian if your mind is not dominated by the word of God. If you want to let the spirit control you, you've got to let the word control you. See, when the word controls me and I'm saturated with the word of God, I'm going to think the the mind of God. I'm going to think the thoughts of God. And so if I want to be spirit-filled, i got to surrender, i got to study the Word of God. Thirdly, if you want to be filled with the Spirit and obey this command, you must seek God in prayer. You must be a person that prays. Now, you're not going to pray as consistently as you should, but a person who doesn't pray at all, or they only ask God to help them in emergency situations, they're spare-tire Christians. You see, you only use your spare tire when you're in an emergency situation. You got a lot of spare tire Christians in the church. What they do is they say, God, help me in this situation, but they're not seeking the Lord at all. They're not interested in following the Lord. They don't want to seek God in worship. And so you got to surrender. You got to study the word. You got to seek God in prayer. And then finally, if you want to be spirit filled and keep this command, you got to say you're sorry for sin. In other words, you got to confess your sin. When you blow it, you got to say, Lord, forgive me for that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have thought that. Lord, I blew up at that person on the phone. Lord, forgive me for my motive. My motive was jealous. I shouldn't have been jealous. I shouldn't have said that unkind word. You say, Mike, what about sins that I forget to confess? If I forget to confess them, does that mean I'm not spirit-filled? No, because God expects you to deal with the sins that you are aware of, but you know what 1 John chapter 2 says? The blood of Christ continually, the Greek says, cleanses us from all sin. And so God knows there are sins that we're not aware of, that sometimes we commit a sin, we're not even aware we've committed a sin. God doesn't want us to walk in bondage. He wants us to walk in freedom. And so what Paul here does is he gives us the command, be filled with the Spirit. It is something continual that you and I are to be doing in our life. It is a walk of being Spirit-filled. It is a lifestyle. And if you're not a Spirit-filled Christian and you're not obeying that command, there's only one alternative. You're a carnal Christian or you're not saved. It's one of those three things. Which one do you fall into? Either you're a spirit-filled Christian as a lifestyle, either you're a carnal Christian, or you're not saved. You're unregenerate. Which one of those would you say you fall into? You say, Mike, how do I know if I'm obeying this command 
to be filled with the Spirit. Well, he's going to give us some of the evidences here in a minute, but we've seen the command to be filled with the Spirit. Now let's secondly look at the contrast of being filled with the Spirit. What is the contrast that he gives or the analogy to being filled with the Spirit? I want you to notice, if you will, verse 18. He says, and do not get drunk with wine. There's the contrast. For that is dissipation. That is wastefulness. That is debauchery. He says, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, the contrast is this. Instead of letting the Spirit control you, Paul says you're allowing alcohol to control you. That's the contrast. Either you're allowing some other influence to control you, or you're allowing the Holy Spirit to control you. Now, here's the question. Why would Paul use this in Ephesians and say, as a contrast, do not get drunk with wine? Well, you have to understand the Greek culture of that time particularly in Ephesus with Rome, they had two types of gods that they worshiped. The Greek god was called Dionysius. You'll notice him on the left here. He was the god of wine. And then in the Roman culture, you had what was called Bacchus. Bacchus was the god of wine. Now, you have to understand in that culture, one of the things that they would do, unlike our culture today, when we drink today and we get drunk, We do it either to drown our sorrows or we're depressed, or we do it because we want to get, we want to have a good time and we want to party with other people. In that culture, they did it for those reasons as well. But one of the reasons they got drunk was to commune with the deities. Because what would happen is, is when you would drink yourself into a stupor and then you would commit gluttony, I know the Romans had what they call vomitoriums, where they would drink as much as they could drink they would eat as much as they could eat, and then they would vomit in a hole, and then they would go back and they would do some more. That's why he says it's dissipation. It's total debauchery. And so what they would do is they would drink, and they believed that when you got drunk and you got intoxicated, it allowed you to commune with the deities. And Paul says if you want to commune with God, the contrast is don't get drunk with wine Don't get drunk with alcohol, or today we would say get high on drugs, marijuana, whatever it is, any substance that you're trying to get high on, he's saying don't let that happen. He said rather let the Spirit control you. And isn't it interesting in the contrast, whether it's drinking and alcohol controlling you or drugs controlling you or the Spirit controlling you, both of those affect your walk. You've seen a drunk person before. In fact, some of you in your past, you got drunk. I got drunk. You know how it affects your speech and it affects your walk. In fact, when we were at Five Points several months ago, I was talking to a guy who was drunk as a skunk. And it's funny, when people are drunk, they get very honest with you. Have you noticed? People become very vulnerable and they share all their problems with you. Well, this guy, you could just tell, and he was very, very open and he listened. It affected his walk and it affected his speech. Well, that's the same thing as the spirit-filled life. If you're spirit-filled, it's going to affect your walk and it's going to affect your speech. And so here's the contrast. Paul says, if you're going to get inebriated, get inebriated with the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit control you and affect your walk. Don't let alcohol and getting drunk. Now, this raises a question that I want to answer. Should Christians drink alcohol? Because I know this is sort of an application that we can extrapolate from this passage. Paul clearly says here that drunkenness is a sin, and you could look at Proverbs chapter 30, you could look at other portions of Scripture where the Bible says drinking strong drink in order to get drunk is a sin. You say, well, how much is strong drink? Can I get tipsy? Can I get buzzed? Well, listen, getting buzzed is a form of getting drunk. There's degrees of drunkenness. So the Bible condemns drunkenness. I think all Christians agree on that. Where all Christians don't always agree is can Christians have wine? Can Christians have beer? Can Christians have liquor? Am I free in Christ to have a drink? And let me just say this. The Bible never says it's a sin to have a drink. It says it's a sin to get drunk. It never says it's a sin to have a drink. However, 
Just because the Bible gives you liberty in that area doesn't necessarily mean that you should partake of alcohol. And so how do you know whether or not you should drink or I should have a drink? Well, the Bible gives several principles. Let me give them to you real quickly. And this will help navigate you on whether or not you should take a drink of alcohol. Here are the principles. Number one, will it cause another believer to stumble? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, if I cause another believer to stumble with my alcohol, he says I should refrain from it. So that means if you're with somebody and you don't know what their convictions are about alcohol and they're a Christian and you don't know their background, the Bible says don't just help yourself to a drink in front of them because you may offend them or you may actually lead them into sin. This has happened before. That's why leaders have to be very, very careful because if a leader is drinking alcohol and someone sees that leader, they may say, well, you know, if Pastor Mike and Pastor John have a drink, it must be okay for me. And I'm not saying it's a sin for me or John to have a drink. I'm simply saying is we don't want to be a stumbling block to another believer. And so this applies to your children. If you're drinking socially in front of them, you may be causing them to stumble down the road. Second principle that should navigate your decision on whether or not you should drink is it will it violate my conscience or, to say it another way, can I do it in faith? Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 8 and especially in Romans 14. He says, what is not of faith is sin. And Paul was dealing with this issue in Romans 14. Drinking wine was one of the issues. And he says, look, if you cannot do it in faith and it violates your conscience and it bothers you, Paul says, don't do it, because he says, what is not of faith is sin. Now, if you can do it and it doesn't bother your conscience, again, I want to reiterate, I'm not talking about drunkenness here. I'm talking about having a drink, or for some of you, you can have two drinks and it's not going to affect you. You got to know what your limits are. But if it violates your conscience and you cannot do it in faith, the Bible says, don't do it. Thirdly, will it enslave me? 1 Corinthians 6, 12, Paul says all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. I will not be mastered by anything. Now listen, if you have an area of weakness with alcohol, don't take a drink. I can tell you right now, you're going to violate this principle because it's going to enslave you. Some of you can have a drink and it doesn't affect you, and you're not tempted by it, and you're not a regular drinker. Some of you if you have one drink, it sends you down a path you don't want to go, and it's a gateway to drugs, or it's a gateway to alcohol. And so you have to ask the question, will this enslave me? Now, you're listening, say amen. amen. Don't justify it. Well, you know, I can handle my liquor. I can handle my beer. How many of us, we are so adept at rationalizing our sin? Well, I can handle it, and the next thing we know, we're getting drunk. Here's a fourth principle. Will it hinder my testimony with non-believers? Will it hinder my testimony with non-believers? He mentions this in chapter 10, and he basically says this, if non-believers see you drinking and it hinders the gospel, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and in chapter 10, I will not do anything that will hinder the gospel. So you got to know your context and you got to know what's going on. Now, I know some of you are saying, hey, non-believers would love it if I drank because then it would justify their sin. And that's why you got to be careful. And then the final principle I would add, if you should have a drink or not, is this. Will it glorify God? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to what? The glory of God. And so can you glorify God in having a beer? with your wings. Can you glorify God having a glass of wine? You say, well, Mike, is it possible to glorify God having a glass of wine? Sure you can. You can give God praise for that. But listen, these are the principles. So let me reiterate. Paul says, do not get drunk with wine. That's the contrast, but be filled with the Spirit. Instead of getting drunk, he says, be filled. That's the contrast. So we know drunkenness is out. But the question is, can you have a drink? And what I would suggest is you follow these five principles, and if you can answer these five principles, then that's between you and God. John and I are not going to get up here and say, if you have a drink, you're living in sin. Any pastor that says that, he's going beyond the bounds of Scripture. However, the Bible does give these principles. Now, I have to be honest with you. 
In the Northeast, where I came from, social drinking there is far more prevalent than it is here. Now, I know it goes on here more often than not. In fact, I've run into people in our church that are drinking. When they see me, they turn pale as a ghost. You know, in the Northeast, I wasn't used to the amount of social drink that went on there. People throw graduation parties, not sanctioned by the church, obviously, but they would just have containers of liquor everywhere. And I used to say, man, you got to be careful with that. You don't know know who you're inviting to these uh, graduation parties. You could be a stumbling block. So again, the principle is be discerning. We're not trying to be legalistic here. So we've seen the command to be filled with the Spirit, the contrast of being filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk with wine. And by the way, before I move on, let me add this. You say, well, what about marijuana? Listen, marijuana is in another category because it affects the mind. Now, alcohol can, but you can have a drink, okay, and not get tipsy. I I don't smoke reefer. I never have, but I don't know. Can you smoke a reefer and not get high on one? I don't know, but I just say it's a different category. And listen, don't justify it for medical purposes. Now, I know some people use it for medical purposes, and that's a whole other category, but some people use it for recreational use, and I think Paul's prohibition here would stand. Don't smoke dope, but be filled with what? The Spirit. All right, let's look at the final point for this evening, and that is the consequences or results of being filled with the Spirit. What are the consequences If I am a spirit-filled Christian, what are the results? Let me say it this way. How do I know if I'm a spirit-filled Christian? If God commands me to be filled with the Spirit, how do I know if I'm a spirit-filled Christian or how do I know if I'm a carnal Christian? And by the way, these five things that I'm going to share with you are not only results or consequences of me being filled with the Spirit, but they're ways to be filled with the Spirit. Let me repeat that again. These five things that I'm about to give you are not only results of being filled with the Spirit, but these five things, if you do them, they will help you be controlled by the Spirit. So what are the consequences of being filled with the Spirit? Let me give them to you. Number one, singing and praising. Notice what he says in verse 19. Speaking. And in the Greek, that means making a sound. And you know, all of us here can make a sound when it comes to music, and some of, most of us cannot carry a tune in a bucket, right? He says, speaking, which is making a sound to one another. What does he mean to one another? Here he's talking about corporate worship. He's saying we are to sing or make a sound together using what? Psalms. That's music from the Psalter or the Psalms in the Old Testament that were often put to music. So he says, when you come together corporately, one of the signs of being spirit-filled and one of the ways you get spirit-filled is that you will corporately make a sound of worship and you will sing the Psalms. Now, obviously, this was in Paul's day. There are people today that still sing the Psalms. Some of our contemporary music today come from the Psalms. And then he says here, hymns. What is that? Well, those are songs of praise that exalted Christ. We have our hymns today. They probably were a little different back in the early church, but we understand the Psalms today, and we also understand the hymns where we exalt Christ. And then he also says spiritual songs. These are songs of testimony covering a wide variety of truth. We have our praise choruses that we sing, a lot of the contemporary music. In fact, Calvary Chapel was the movement God raised up to start really contemporary Christian music, Maranatha. In fact, if you look at Maranatha music, the Dove logo is what they have. And so when God was birthing revival during the hippie movement in the late 60s and early 70s, new music was coming about. And that typically happens during periods of revival. And so what he says here is this, if you and I are going to be spirit-filled, one of the results is that we will sing and we will praise God. He goes on to say, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. That word making melody there means plucking through a stringed instrument. And so what he's saying is, 
If you want to be spirit-filled, start worshiping and praising God when you come to church. Worship and praise God in your car. Worship and praise God during your devotional time. That's how you get controlled by the Spirit, but it's also one of the evidences of being a Spirit-filled Christian is what? Is that you worship God. Now, I'm not saying every second you're going to worship and praise God, but as a lifestyle, you're going to have an attitude of worship and praise towards God. That's how you know you're Spirit-filled. And if you want to get filled with the Spirit, if you feel like you're dry spiritually, if you feel like you're in a rut spiritually, if you feel like you're struggling with carnality, start listening to praise music in your car. Isn't it amazing when you're in a foul mood, when you're in a negative mood, when you're feeling down and depressed and discouraged? What happens when you put on praise music? I know my wife loves to listen to Dallas Home. Remember Dallas Home in the 1980s? That was her favorite guy that she listened to, and she puts him on on a regular basis because it lifts her spirit. you got to find out what group lifts your spirit, and you know what? Worship God. There's a second consequence or result of being filled with the Spirit, and that is this, saying thanks, saying thanks. Notice, if you will, verse 20, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. A second result of being spirit-filled is you're going to be a Christian that gives thanks to God. Again, if you want to be controlled by the Spirit, start thanking God even when you don't feel like it. Wake up thanking God. God, thank you that my feet were able to hit the ground. When you turn on the shower, Lord, I want to thank you for my family. Lord, I want to thank you for hot water. Lord, I want to thank you for toothpaste. Lord, I want to thank you for toilet. I want to thank you for indoor plumbing. Lord, I want to thank you for air condition. Amen? You see, all these things, you say, Mike, I don't feel like thanking God. It has nothing to do with how you feel. It is choosing to thank God and not grumble. You see, you show me a person that complains, that's critical all the time, that's always negative, always sees the negative side of everything, I'll show you a carnal Christian. Now, again, we all get like that. We all commit acts of carnality. There's a difference between acts of carnality and a lifestyle of carnality. We all complain. We all get critical. I'm talking about lifestyle here. If you're a spirit-filled Christian, you got a thankful heart. You're always thanking God. You're not constantly grumbling and complaining. And if you want to get filled with the Spirit, not only worship and praise God, but you know what? Give thanks to God on a regular basis. He says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, your thanksgiving is consistent with who God is. There's a third consequence of being filled with the Spirit, and that is submitting. Look at verse 21. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. If you're a spirit-filled Christian, you know what that means? You're open, you're teachable, you're submissive to other people, you're not constantly obdurate, difficult, bellicose personality, always wanting to fight with people, always a rebellious spirit, always argumentative. Well, I don't care what you say. I don't care what these, I don't care what the pastors say. I don't care about this. There's always this attitude of rebellion and unsubmissiveness. See, that is an indication of carnality. Now, we all struggle with this at times, right? And the Bible says we're to submit to one another. Now, next week, we're going to look at how Paul gets more specific, and he says, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. But you know what, husbands? There's times where we submit to our wives. Isn't that true? And so a person who is submissive in their heart, they're open, they're teachable. Now listen, this doesn't mean you don't disagree with people. It doesn't mean you don't at times have conflict. But in the end, you're willing to resolve issues because you're teachable. you got a submissive heart. Well, there's another consequence of being filled with the Spirit, and that is sharing or serving. If I'm a Spirit-filled Christian, I'm going to share Christ, and I'm going to serve Christ. Now, for this, we go to another passage of Scripture, not in Ephesians, but in Acts 1.8. Jesus, before he ascended back to the Father, he gave the disciples their marching orders, and here is what he said in Acts 1.8, familiar passage, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, my martyrion, my martyrs, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you're going to have power, and you're going to be my witness, and it may lead to martyrdom. 
That's what the word witness meant. Because in that day, if you witness for Christ, you could die for your faith. How do I know I'm a spirit-filled Christian? It doesn't mean you're going to be a Billy Graham to everyone you see. But if you're spirit-filled and the power of the Holy Spirit is in your life, listen, you're going to want to tell other people about Jesus. You're going to want to tell other people about Jesus. And why is it the church today has quenched the Spirit? Because we don't want to tell people about Jesus. Now, we need to do it in a gracious way, in a tactful way. The Bible says in Colossians 4, be wise in the way you deal with outsiders. You don't grab them and stab them. I understand that. But listen, if we're not sharing with other people, what does that say about our Christianity? We're embarrassed. Some of you haven't shared your faith in years. You know what that says? You're embarrassed of Jesus. Listen, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You are embarrassed. You are a CIA Christian. You're a closet Christian. You're embarrassed. And you're more concerned about your pride and self-preservation than you are your coworker, your family member, or your friend going to hell. That's pride. I'm that way at times. There's times where God has prompted me to share and I've kept my mouth shut. And so you got to be intentional. You say, well, Mike, this just doesn't flow out of me. I'm an introvert in my personality. I understand that and God understands that. That's why I said we're not all going to be Billy Grahams. But how can we say we're spirit-filled if we're not interested in sharing our faith with anybody? We've got to be intentional about doing that. He says, you will be my witnesses. And it's not just sharing, it's serving. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. He says this, whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving, here it is, by the strength which God supplies. Notice God gives you power, he gives you strength to serve him. And so listen, if I'm a spirit-filled Christian, I'm going to want to serve. No one had to cajole me to serve. When I committed my life to the Lord, I wanted to get involved. Now, I realize it's a process. Some people, it takes a little bit of time to get going. But ultimately, I am not going to sit soaking sour for years. I'm going to get involved. And if I don't know what my gifts are, I'm going to find some way to serve and get involved. Why? Because part of being spirit-filled, being controlled by the Spirit, is I want to honor and serve God. Why? Because it's the hunger of my heart. It's what compels me and drives me. Well, there's one final consequence for this evening, and that is this. We're going to show spiritual fruit. If we are spirit-filled Christians, we are going to produce the fruit of the Spirit. We all know this, Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit, notice it's not fruits, but it's fruit. It's like one fruit with multiple plugs. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Do you see love in your life? Do you see joy? Do you see peace? Do you see patience? Do you see kindness? Do you see goodness? Do you see faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Against such thing there is no law. Have you ever seen a law out there that says, hey, stop being patient? Hey, stop being joyful and kind to people. You don't see any laws on that. Why? Because our, even our culture wants people to be that way. How do you know you're spirit-filled? Do you see the fruit of the Spirit in your life? You say, Mike, how do I know if I'm a spirit-filled Christian or a carnal Christian? Are you ready? Here it is. Are you worshiping and singing and praising God? Secondly, are you saying thanks? Thirdly, are you submitting to others? Is there a spirit of teachability? Number four, are you what? Sharing Christ and serving Christ. And number five, are you showing spiritual fruit in your life? That's how you know you're a spirit-filled Christian. If you don't see those things in your life at all, you're either a carnal Christian, you're not saved. That's it. It's very simple. And again, we're talking about not the perfection of your life here, the direction of your life. And so if you and I are going to walk worthy, Paul says we need to walk in the what? We need to walk in the Spirit. He says, here's the command be being kept filled with the Spirit. It's a command. We're to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit control us. That's the command. And then he shows us the contrast. Rather than getting drunk, be controlled by the Spirit. 
Don't let alcohol or drugs control you. Let the Spirit control you. And then finally, he gives the consequences and shows us here's the results if you and I are Spirit-filled Christians. Now, next week, we're going to look at the eighth way that you and I could walk worthy. And you know what that is? Walking in proper biblical relationships. We're going to look at husband and wife, parent and child, master and slave, or employee, employer. You see, if I'm walking in the Spirit, it's going to affect my relationships. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for reminding us of the Spirit-filled life and how you call us, command us to be controlled by your Spirit. We thank you, Father, that we're indwelt by the Spirit. We've been baptized in the Spirit. We've been sealed with the Spirit. And we've been regenerated, made alive by the Spirit. But Lord, help us to be controlled by the Spirit. And may we be Spirit-filled Christians as a lifestyle. Father, forgive us. We all get in the flesh. We say things, do things, think things that we shouldn't. But help us to keep confessing and keep appropriating the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.